when we last left Commodore Nelson, he was, amongst other things, sneaking through the Spanish fleet at night in the frigate Minerva, heading for the Atlantic as the Royal Navy had been forced to withdraw from the Mediterranean. With this task accomplished, however, Nelson would reboard and resume command of HMS Captain, a 74-gun ship of the line, and it wouldn't be long before he would see his first major fleet action. Or at least his first major fleet action that would turn into an actual battle, as opposed to one of Admiral Hotham's vaguely chase the enemy and then withdraw policies. Whilst Nelson knew the approximate location of the Spanish fleet, due to having passed through it, it, the fog that had concealed him had also meant he couldn't accurately count the numbers. And so in the early weeks of February 1797, both the British and Spanish fleets were actually looking for each other, both having completely misread the other's size. The Spanish fleet consisted of 24 ships of the line, including the massive Nuestra Señora de Santísima Trinidad, whilst Jervis's fleet was significantly outnumbered with 15 ships of the line to its own credit, albeit that this did include HMS Victory, which was making yet another cameo appearance in Nelson's career. For his part, Jervis thought the Spanish fleet was somewhat smaller, having based it his guess purely on estimates made by Nelson and others who had sighted portions of the fleet, and the Spanish fleet, led by Don José de Cordoba, also thought, perhaps based on slightly firmer intelligence, that the British only had nine ships of the line. This was because his most recent intelligence came from a passing American merchantman who had been sailing past the British fleet a few days earlier and had only seen nine ships of the line. This was in fact an entirely forgivable error because at the time that was all the fleet had. A squadron of five ships under Admiral Parker had been off doing another mission, whilst HMS Culloden had been off chasing a Spanish merchantman or frigate, and so only nine were actually in the battle line at the time. Admiral Jervis, of course, thought that, well, 15 ships of the line against maybe 17 or 18 opponents would be a pretty good fight to have, and Admiral Cordoba definitely thought that 24 versus 9 was excellent odds for his fleet. Originally, the Spanish fleet had been supposed to sail through the Straits of Gibraltar to link up with the French fleet to form a large Franco-Spanish fleet, as they would do later on in the Napoleonic Wars, but they'd been waiting in Cartagena for a Spanish convoy, which they could then form a heavy escort for, thus killing two birds with one stone. But with the reports of a very understrength English fleet nearby, Cordoba had decided he was going to make the break for it and try and finish them off first. And so in the early morning hours of February the 14th, 1797, in what was still a very foggy area, the British fleet heard signal guns coming from the Spanish fleet, so they knew that they were close. Jervis, of course, knew that victory was especially important at this point because, well, they just lost the Mediterranean and so to lose what had been the Mediterranean fleet as well would be a double blow to British public morale and might even force Britain out of the war entirely. And so as dawn broke, he ordered his fleet into a single line, as they'd been previously travelling in two columns, and prepared for battle. It was at this point that he discovered that if you included the frigates present on both sides, five on the British side and seven on the Spanish, he was actually outnumbered about two to one. But he had one small advantage. The Spanish fleet was in a much looser formation than his own, and five or six Spanish ships were off in their own little squadron that was trying to rejoin the rest. This, of course, would only be a temporary situation, but for the moment, the Spanish ships of the line were actually, in the, at least in their main formation, about the strength that he thought they were. And so, with on, only a few moments to take the decision, he decided to hoist all sail and drive his fleet headlong at the Spanish, trying to get between the two formations to sp keep them split up. This had one additional advantage in that it meant that the British ships could utilise both broadsides since they'd have targets all around. And so onwards they drove. The larger Spanish force turned towards the British and they passed each other on opposite tacks, blazing away. 
whilst the port side guns of the British fleet engaged the smaller Spanish squadron. To their credit, the smaller Spanish squadron's commander decided he was going to try something that Nelson would later try himself and break the British line. This would have slowed the British advance completely and allowed the larger Spanish formation to fall on the British from the other side, but as it turned out, despite damage to some British ships that were doing a turnabout to chase after the larger Spanish group, a mixture of incredible discipline by the Royal Navy as well as mutually supporting fire, helped by a series of rapid, heavy broadsides from the various ships, managed to drive the smaller Spanish group back and they had to content themselves with trying to sail up the other side of the British line to hopefully try and catch up with their fellows. Although this did of course mean that the, a large portion of the British line was also bracketed by two squadrons of Spanish vessels. In this particular encounter, victory showed itself to be a superlative sailor once again, as the closest the Spanish actually got to breaking the line was with the Principe de Astorias, but that vessel was cut off by victory, which was obviously quite fast for a first rate, and instead managed to rake the slightly larger Spanish ship twice. The British ships were turning in succession, but this left something of a problem. Jervis's intention and orders were quite clear to engage the larger Spanish force and capture or destroy as many of them as possible. However, with the turn in succession, the Spanish forces were actually now drawing north of the British forces, which gave the opportunity for the smaller Spanish formation to the east to try and join up with the larger Spanish formation to the west, which with both formations bearing towards each other. This would have left the British fleet in a single line trying to harry the stern of the Spanish ships, much as the English fleet had had to do to the Armada on its way up the English Channel several hundred years earlier. Commodore Nelson, aboard the captain, was near the rear of the British line and now faced the eternal quandary of naval officers. Were he to follow the letter of Jervis's orders, he would take his ship around the point of turn along with all the others, and the Spanish fleet would slip away despite Jervis's clear intention to try and capture or destroy them. If, however, he took some other form of action which would fulfil the spirit of Jervis's intentions, he would of course be guilty of disobeying what was technically a direct order to follow in line astern and then turn by in succession. There was one option that Nelson could see. If he put his ship hard about to port, he could basically double back on himself much quicker and try and head off the vanguard of the Spanish fleet. This would interpose himself between the two Spanish forces, which would make it slightly harder for them to join up, and hopefully would also slow them down, thus allowing the bulk of Jervis's forces to overhaul them. Of course, there was this slight issue of the fact that HMS Captain was a single 74-gun third-rate, and he would be taking it right into the teeth of some of the largest capital ships on the planet, the leading elements of the Spanish fleet, including the San Josef and the San Jose, and the Salvador del Mundo, all of 112 guns, uh, the San Nicolas of 84 guns, the Mexicano, another 112-gunner, the San Isidro, a 74-gunner, and the Nuestra Señora de Santísima Trinidad, at this point mounting 130 guns. So, yeah, he was slightly outnumbered and quite heavily outgunned. So, of course, it's Nelson. What do you think he did? He put his ship over hard to port and drove headlong at the Spanish, taking on the San Josef, Santissima Trinidad and San Nicolas in a three-on-one gunfight. Seeing what was going on, Jervis ordered his remaining rearmost ships, Diadem and Excellent, to haul round and join the front of his formation, which was gradually overhauling the Spanish, although it was too late for them to go into direct support of the rather embattled captain, which had now devolved into a six-on-one fight. Luckily, it would be afforded some respite as HMS Culloden, leading the main British line, managed to catch up far quickly enough to start pouring broadsides into the Spanish vessels, albeit this was still now two 74s versus six Spanish vessels, including four first rates. Nelson took advantage of the slight distraction to replenish his ammunition from the magazines deep below and also re-rig some of his ship's masts and rigging, which had suffered quite considerably under the Spanish attention, but it was 
as something of a losing battle, as the captain was being relatively quickly taken apart by the pounding broadsides of the Spanish ships. Nonetheless, his gambit had worked. The Spanish main fleet had slowed down, the British fleet was overhauling it Pac-Man style, and the squadron off to the east was milling around in some confusion, wondering exactly what it should be doing. After about an hour of combat, the captain was pretty much uncontrollable, and Nelson found himself near enough drifting past the San Nicolas. He decided there was nothing better for it, and ordered what remained of the ship's agility be put into placing Captain alongside the San Nicolas, and promptly la launched a boarding action with the uh, slightly odd and definitely upper-class battle cry of Westminster Abbey or Glorious Victory, i.e. A, a tomb in Westminster Abbey if he didn't quite manage the, this particular feat, he surged across with his men, luckily not suffering from a lack of depth perception and falling into the middle, because that would have been quite embarrassing, and relatively rapidly overcame the deck crew of San Nicolas. For a 74-gunner that had near enough been shot apart, to be able to successfully take an 84-gunner in a boarding action was impressive enough, but San Josef had decided to try and come to its embattled compatriots' aid. Unfortunately, due to damage it had taken, it ended up being tangled up with San Nicolas, and <laughs> effectively ended up moored alongside it on the other side. Nelson promptly saw this, realised what the threat would be if the San Josef's crew managed to get itself organised, and led what was left of his boarding party in a second boarding action across the deck of the freshly acquired San Nicolas, and boarded San Josef as well. The 112 gunners crew were somewhat surprised by the small, sprightly, one-eyed British captain and his heterogeneous mix of boarding party companions, and after a short but viciously fought battle, San Josef was also in Nelson's hands. It was traditional in this period for officers of surrendered ships, or indeed on land surrendered forts and towns and armies, to offer their swords to the victorious general admiral, or in this case, Commodore. The scene becoming somewhat comedic as there were so many officers aboard San Josef and San Nicolas that Nelson had to resort to first tucking the swords under his arm and then later handing them off to a nearby assistant because there were just so many of them. Elsewhere in the battle, the Santissima Trinidad had actually surrendered at one point, but had then been rescued by other Spanish vessels, whilst the San Salvador del Mundo had had the misfortune to tangle directly with HMS Victory in a prolonged gunfight, and had come off somewhat the worse for it. Along with San Isidro, they were the other two ships who would surrender to British forces at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. HMS Captain, however, was in a sorry state, effectively being a shot-riddled hulk at this point, having expended 146 barrels of powder, and at some point having run so low on ammunition that the carronade gunners had been caught stuffing 9-pounder cannonballs into their barrels taken from some of the ship's chase guns. It was noted that her overall expenditure of gunpowder and ammunition was actually in excess of what she was rated to carry when she was first launched and fully stocked. So someone had been very clever about stashing away extra gunpowder and shot on the ship, even though, as I said, she'd almost run out even so. Nevertheless, she wasn't going anywhere soon, and ironically enough, the frigate Minerva was back again to tow the captain off for repairs. Commodore Nelson was thus transferred to the wonderfully named HMS Irresistible, and shortly thereafter came welcome news. Jervis became Earl St. Vincent in honour of his victory, Nelson became a Knight of the Bath for his part in it, and a few days later, completely unrelated to the battle, he actually became a Rear Admiral of the Blue. Interestingly, Jervis was left in something of a quandary, inasmuch as it was clearly Nelson's actions that had helped achieve the victory that had come about, but at the same time there was that small issue of Nelson having disregarded orders. Since Nelson's scheme had worked, it would be inappropriate to reprimand or discipline him, so Jervis decided to compromise by obviously not reprimanding Nelson, but also by not including him in the official account of the battle in any significant detail. 
There followed a dispute between Rear Admiral William Parker, who claimed that Nelson had had considerably more support than Nelson said, and of course Nelson's version of events, but overall, once various crewmen and such had had their say, it appears that Nelson's version of events, which we've just recounted, won out. Rear Admiral Nelson would now be transferred to HMS Theseus as a more permanent command, and would be ordered to take charge of the inner squadron, i.e. the one closest to the target, during the blockade of Cadiz, blocking in many of the Spanish ships that had escaped from the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. There was a dual role to this particular blockade. One, of course, was to keep the Spanish fleet bottled up and hopefully finish it off if it happened to sail out. But secondly, the large Spanish treasure fleet that would routinely sail in from their holdings in South and Central America was due, and it was due in Cadiz. So hopefully, by terminating all outside contact with the port, the British could receive the Spanish treasure fleet as it so dutifully showed up. Admiral Jervis, or I suppose as we should now call him Earl St. Vincent, knew exactly the kind of man he'd put in charge of the blockading squadron, and he had no illusions that Nelson was going to simply sit outside Cadiz and wait for the Spanish to do something, and so he issued the following order. The Commander-in-Chief thinks it expedient, from intelligence lately received, that the launches and the barges of the two divisions under Vice Admiral Thompson and Rear Admiral Parker should assemble on board the Theseus between 9 and 10 o'clock every night, armed with carronades, pikes, cutlasses, broad axes, and chopping knives, a clamp in each boat, with spikes, a sledgehammer, and a coil of small rope, to tow off any armed brig, mortar, or gunboat that is carried, and to follow the directions of Rear Admiral Nelson for the night. And having given Nelson charge of a bunch of sailors as well as carte blanche to effectively go in and steal anything that wasn't literally bolted down, unbolt anything that was bolted down and steal that, and then stab or set fire to anybody who tried to stop them, it can hardly come as much of a surprise that shortly thereafter, Nelson was found with a bomb vessel, the Thunder, sneaking up to the walls of Cadiz, despite its fortifications and many guns, along with several boatloads of very angry sailors, with the whole formation then proceeding to lob mortar shells into the embattled city until something happened. What happened was a large portion of smaller Spanish craft, mortar vessels, gunboats and the like, came surging out to meet them. There followed a very close action when it was discovered that Thunder's mortar was in fact somewhat broken, and so it had to withdraw, but after a rather vicious hand-to-hand -hand action, the Spanish were driven off, and it turned out that, in the morning's light, the British fleet had grown to the tune of two mortar vessels and an armed launch. Nelson, of course, was leading all of this from a barge, which, being on the front lines, ended up in a boarding action with that of the Spanish small craft commander, with the battle just about going the British's way, but with Nelson being saved by his coxswain, John Sykes, twice during the engagement, with the poor man taking the wounds for him. In a letter home, Earl St. Vincent said, This brave man twice saved the life of his commander by parrying the blows that were aimed at him, and at last actually interposed his own head to receive the full force of a Spanish sabre, which, fighting as they were hand to hand, could not otherwise have pre been prevented from falling on Sir Horatio. Thus dearly was Nelson beloved. John Sykes would have been made a lieutenant had he lived. After several more attacks, although fortunately somewhat slightly less hazardous to Nelson's personal health, circumstances found him trying to fit a ten-inch mortar in a rowboat when an idea occurred to him. Whilst Cadiz's defences were probably a little bit too strong to be carried entirely, simply by inventive use of artillery in small boats, there was, nearby, relatively speaking, the island of Tenerife, specifically the city of Santa Cruz de Tenerife, on Tenerife, where it was rumoured that a Spanish treasure galleon had recently landed a large quantity of treasure, and the city was markedly less well defended as compared to Cadiz. Nelson put two and two together and promptly asked for and received permission to go off and try and capture that location instead. Unfortunately, this particular expedition didn't end quite so well. 
they managed to achieve the element of surprise, but the weather then meant they had to kind of just sit there and the surprised Spanish rapidly became the somewhat less surprised Spanish, who promptly started to reinforce their own defences. And so when the various boats went ashore to try and land and take the city, the defenders were well prepared, helped by the fact that in the darkness and the strong currents, several boats landed in the wrong locations and scattered the attacking forces. For Nelson, the entire attack consisted of a very brief period where he managed to take a few steps ashore from his boat and was then promptly shot in the arm by a musket, and was therefore quite rapidly withdrawn via the same boat back to the Theseus, where he appeared to be more annoyed than anything else by this turn of events. On his way back to HMS Theseus, he noticed from the cr cries of alarm from the crew that the cutter HMS Fox had taken a hit and was sinking. Thus, when the boat was brought alongside the Theseus, he wrapped the rope that had been thrown over the side around his one good arm and ordered the boat to go and try and save some of the crew from the Fox managing to make his way up the side of the 74 gunner using one arm and the two legs that he had, which he noted were still working properly. Having found the surgeon, he had his arm taken off at the elbow and within about half an hour was giving orders to the rest of the crew as if nothing had happened. Once the battle was over, however, obviously ending in failure, Nelson was somewhat dejected concluding that England would have little use for an admiral with one arm and one eye, even if it had had perhaps some use for an admiral who had just lost the eye. With what was left of his arm needing better medical attention than could be provided for in the fleet, he was put aboard HMS Seahorse and sailed for England, arriving on the 1st of September 1797. His initial recovery would be quite long and arduous due to complications with the amputated arm stump. But after several months, he began to recover quite swiftly, enjoying the news that the absolutely gigantic Admiral Duncan had managed to defeat a Dutch fleet at the Battle of Camperdown, with Nelson joking he would have quite happily given his other arm to be present at that particular encounter. He then proceeded to amuse himself by going to collect his injury pay. This consisted of a year's pay upon production of a certificate of the permanent injury. He'd been away for so long he hadn't actually had a chance to collect the payment for the loss of his eye and hadn't managed to acquire a certificate. The clerk obviously refused him the payment since he didn't have the appropriate certificate, which made Nelson somewhat annoyed because, well, it should have been rather obvious that he didn't have his eye anymore, and apart from anything else, as Admiral Nelson, surely everyone would have heard about it by now. Nevertheless, he went off to find a appropriate surgeon to certify that, yes, in fact, his eye was missing, and whilst he was at it, he might as well get a certificate that said that his arm was missing as well. Having submitted both and then returned to the clerk for payment, the clerk remarked that the amount of money he was handing over was relatively small. Oh, replies Nelson, this payment is only for my eye. In a few days I shall come back for my arm, and a little time longer, God knows, most probably for a leg. With his spirits thus restored, despite his earlier plans to retire, Nelson began pestering the Admiralty for another command. They initially promised to give him the 80-gun HMS Foudroyant, which, despite its name, was not actually a captured French ship. It was, fair enough, a copy of a captured French 80-gun ship of the same name, but this was one of only two 80-gun vessels actually built in British yards. However, she wasn't quite ready for sea, and so he went aboard the 74-gunner HMS Vanguard instead, and a year and a month after the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, he headed on south to see what he could do about annoying the French some more. Earl St. Vincent had been present in the theatre the entire time, and whilst Vanguard was initially dispatched to Cadiz to continue the blockade duties, he was very rapidly dispatched further by St. Vincent onward to Toulon to go and specifically annoy the French rather than the Spanish. The British knew that the French were gathering an invasion force, but for quite where they weren't sure. This was one of the reasons Nelson had been sent to Toulon. However, on the way, the squadron was hit by quite the storm and scattered. 
whilst he was trying to recover all his ships back into some kind of usable formation, the French invasion fleet sailed, and thus Nelson showed up off of Toulon to discover it was practically empty of any significant sized vessels. Nelson then started a search, first looking off the Italian coast and finding nothing, then heading down to Malta to find that the island had surrendered to the French invasion fleet before it had moved on. And after discussions with his fellow officers, Nelson decided that it was probable the French were heading to Egypt, which indeed they were. Nelson promptly set off for Egypt, but (laughs) ran into something of a misfortune as the French fleet, of course, included troop transports, which were not particularly swift, and thus in the age before, well, any form of particularly advanced navigational instrument beyond clocks and sextants, he actually unknowingly overhauled the French invasion force with his own swifter warships, arriving off Alexandria to find not much. Somewhat perturbed, he then went off to look up the Syrian coast to see if perhaps the French had gone there, and two or three days after he'd left the Egyptian coast, the French showed up and promptly invaded. Nelson, of course, knew nothing of this and headed back to Italy, well, Naples to be precise, because, well, Italy as a whole didn't exist yet, restocked his fleet and began the search again, eventually coming across a French merchantman that gave him some clue as to where the French might be, so he headed back to Alexandria, found it empty again, but now that the country was quite clearly under a certain amount of French control, he wandered up and down the Egyptian coast until, at the beginning of August 1798, he found the French fleet at last, sheltering in Aboukir Bay. The French Admiral, Bruy, had anchored his ships quite close into the shoals and prepared to with stand an assault from outside. In this, he had reason to be relatively confident. The gap between his ships and the shoals was very narrow, and the waters were pretty treacherous and shallow, all told. Although he had one less ship of the line compared to Nelson, all of Nelson's ships were third rates of 74 guns, except for HMS Leander of 50 guns. Whereas the French forces included a number of 80-gun ships, had considerably more frigates than Nelson, and of course the flagship, Lorient, was a massive 120-gunner, thus giving Bruy a considerable firepower advantage. As the French forces had not been expecting Nelson to show up quite when he did, a large number of their men were ashore within shore parties, setting up defences and trying to generally assist Napoleon's invasion. Bruy had to pull in crew from various French frigates to try and bulk up the numbers of his own ships, and when he gave an order to sail, he was informed that his ships could probably sail or man the guns, but not both, as a significant portion of men were still ashore. He decided that his defensive position was probably the stronger element of his fleet, and so he decided to man the guns and remain relatively stationary while he waited for men to come back. Nelson, meanwhile, slowed his fleet down so that it could assume a proper formation, and Bruy concluded that since this was happening at about four o'clock in the afternoon, that the British would probably be willing to wait to fight until the following day, by which point he would have had all of his men aboard. Nelson was quite confident of a victory, having already planned how to encounter the French fleet. Specifically, he planned to split his forces to envelop the French fleet from either side, thus allowing him to put broadsides into both sides of the French forces, kind of in a reverse of what Jervis had managed to pull off at Cape St Vincent, with Nelson reasoning that the superior rate of fire that British gunnery afforded him would mean that by engaging a single French ship with two or three of his own, it would very quickly be battered into submission, despite the fact that the French vessel would be able to fight all of its guns at once. Of course, he hadn't quite counted on the shoals and shallows of Aboukir Bay, but still, the plan went into effect pretty quickly. As the action was to take place at night, the British ships raised multiple flags, including an illuminated white ensign, to make sure that their own side knew who they were, and the ships closed in. It was here that the spirit of free thinking that Nelson encouraged, as well as giving general plans out well before a battle, came into its own, as HMS Goliath, near the front of the British line, noticed a small error in the French deployment – 
the lead ship, Gurrier, was in fact slightly further away from the shoals than would otherwise have been good for perfect defence. And so, despite the British fleet initially planning to run down one side of the French fleet, since the shoals were considered too much of a danger, Goliath's captain decided on his own initiative to cut into this gap left in the French defences, rapidly followed by Orion, Theseus, Audacious and Zealous. Poor old HMS Culloden took the turn a little bit too tightly and ran aground, but would then serve as a useful marker for everybody else. Meanwhile, Nelson aboard Vanguard, along with Minotaur, Defence, Bellerophon, Majestic, Alexander, Swiftshire and Leander, began making their pass down the outside of the French forces. On the inside of the line, the French frigate Serieuse made a rather serious mistake. There was a standing naval convention that frigates stayed out of the ship of the line combat, and in turn the ships of the lines would leave the frigates alone, at least during the main fight. However, Serieuse decided to take a few pot shots at HMS Orion under Captain Samaritz as it came round the corner, and, well, having voided its own protection, Captain Samaritz was all too happy to return the favour, waiting until Orion got to within point-blank range before effectively devastating the Sirius with a single massive salvo. The majority of the British fleet was now bracketing the French vanguard and very rapidly taking apart Gurrier, Concorant, Spartier, Aquilon and Peuple Souverain. The French centre of Franklin, Lorient and Tonon were being engaged by some drifting British vessels that had missed their station, but Lorient, despite being stationary, was still a fearsome opponent, and a 120-gunner versus a 74-gunner was always going to be an unequal contest, as the poor old HMS Bellerophon rapidly discovered, being set adrift by repeated battering from Lorient's guns. The British vessels were now putting down their own anchor cables with springs attached, allowing them to rotate their ships to bear on various targets, with vessels switching targets as and when their initial quarry struck its colours. It wasn't all going Nelson's way, though. Some French captains were rather inventive, with both Aquilon and Spartier opening fire on Vanguard, causing quite a number of casualties, including managed to hit Nelson in the head with an iron splinter. Due to the copious amounts of blood that you usually get from head wounds, Nelson thought that he had been hit fatally and was carried below. The ship's surgeon took one look at it, told him it was a flesh wound, stitched it back up again, and told him he was going to live. Nelson then promptly ignored all orders to recuperate and headed back up to the top deck to observe. Although Lorient had managed to drive off the Bellerophon, it had taken quite the pounding in return, Admiral Rui basically being cut in half by a cannonball, although he insisted on remaining on the deck, realising that his injuries were fatal, and not wanting to take up any medical attention from men who might be saved, and so he was only around for about another 15 minutes. As various French ships in the vanguard surrendered, more and more British ships were drifting down the line and engaging Orient, and by 9 o'clock that night it was observed that there were fires on the ship's lower deck. Identifying this as a tactical advantage, the Swiftsure took the brutal but pragmatic decision to focus its fire in the area of the blaze. This, of course, ensured that the French crew were unable to put it out, as every few minutes a scything hail of iron and wood splinters would cut down any damage control parties. This proved somewhat more successful than anybody had imagined, and the fire rapidly took hold along the rest of the ship, spreading up the rigging and catching the sails alight as well. Swiftsure, Alexander and Orion all began edging away, realising what was about to happen. So too did the French ships Tonon, Herriot and Mercure, and sure enough, at around 10 o'clock, the giant French flagship detonated in an awful explosion. As it turned out, most of the ship's measures to get away from the burning vessel hadn't been anywhere close to enough, which was actually relatively fortunate, as whilst the explosion was powerful enough to open up seams and planking on the nearby ships, much of the flaming wreckage of the destroyed first rate actually sailed over nearby ships to land in the sea beyond. Swiftsure and Alexander on the British side and Franklin on the French side did catch fire from falling wreckage, but were able to put these fires out in relatively short order. 
Many of the crew of Lorient had dived into the water to escape the massive conflagration, but the blast was so powerful that many of them were killed in the water by the shockwave. Now, whilst ships had exploded before in combat, one, they'd usually been a lot smaller, and two, it had usually been during the day. The sight of a massive 120-gun first rate going up in flames in the pitch darkness of the night, followed by the titanic explosion of its main magazines, actually shocked both sides into complete silence, with the fighting stopping dead for about ten minutes. As the three ships that had been set on fire by the wreckage fought to extinguish those blazes, Ships from both sides lowered boats to try and rescue survivors, with Nelson ordering that boats be sent from Vanguard to try and rescue some of Lorient's remaining crew. However, the lull in the battle was broken by the French vessel Franklin firing on HMS Swiftshire, and rapidly firing grew in intensity, and the battle was rejoined once again. But by midnight it was pretty much all over, with only the Tonon continuing to offer resistance, as the French ships in the rear of the formation, led by one Pierre Villeneuve, a name that we will come to know and recognise a little bit later on in Nelson's life, had basically sat and watched everything happen. Some scattered fighting occurred in the morning as Villeneuve managed to extract a few surviving ships and sail out into the Mediterranean, although between ships destroyed and captured, the French fleet had been reduced from 13 ships of the line and four frigates to two ships of the line and two frigates, with two vessels destroyed and nine captured, along with two frigates that had basically been totaled. There was an odd sort of aftermath to it as Nelson's dispatches talking about the success were placed aboard the 50-gun Leander, which was sent home, but Leander lost a fight with one of the two surviving French ships of the lines shortly thereafter, and was captured. Thus, it took a little bit of a while for news of this victory to get home aboard the frigate Moutinet. Of all the vessels in the French fleet, the French Tonon demands special note, as it put up one heck of a fight, with the captain insisting on nailing his colours quite literally to the mast to prevent it being surrendered, and Tonant's eventual downfall coming only when the ship was quite literally a shattered hulk and the captain dead. This, the Battle of the Nile, was a major event both in Nelson's personal career and in the overall course of the war against Napoleon, as Napoleon's army was now left stranded in Egypt, which would be something of an inconvenience for him, and for Nelson it was his first major battle where he had led the entire engagement, and he'd come out with quite the decisive victory. Tribute and praise showered in on Nelson from all quarters, not just from Westminster and Whitehall, but also from various other nations that were rather pleased to take Napo see Napoleon taken down a notch, such as Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and various other minor nations. This would also include a pair of rather unusual honours. Nelson was created Baron Nelson of the Nile. You might ask, well, why wasn't he given an earldom or a viscounty like uh, Jervis or Duncan had been after their victories? And it was argued that this was because Nelson had technically been in command of a detached squadron rather than in an entire fleet, which was, after all, yes, actually true. He also received another gift which was quite amusing. Captain Hallowell of the Swiftshire fished out a section of Lorient's mainmast from the water and turned it into a coffin. He then, weirdly enough, sent this to his commanding officer with the note, Sir, I have taken the liberty of presenting you a coffin made of the mainmast of Lorient, that when you have finished your glorious career in this world you may be buried in one of your trophies. But that that period may be far distant is the earnest wish of your sincere friend, B. Hallowell. The early 19th century was a very bizarre time for giving gifts, but, apparently, Nelson received this extraordinary present with utmost cordiality and affection, says one account. He kept it for some time placed upright in his great cabin. Nor was it without apparent reluctance that he at length consented to have it removed below by the entreaties of an old favourite servant, but he gave strict orders that it should be safely stored and reserved for the purpose for which its brave and worthy donor had designed it. <laughs> 
A lot of this did unfortunately, however, go to his head as he took the British fleet back to Naples to refit, resupply and repair, with Vanguard needing a fair bit of the latter. However, it was at this point that he reacquainted himself with the ambassador to Naples, uh, Sir William Hamilton, and more particularly his young wife, Lady Emma Hamilton. There had been some concerns expressed by Earl St. Vincent at their earlier meetings that perhaps something untoward was going on, but now, left pretty much to his own devices, it blew up into a full-on affair. Nelson also decided to try his hand once more at playing on land, and began to show something of a dangerous streak of pride. The Admiralty sent him orders, and he elected to stay in Naples, instead subdelegating those orders to various of his captains to blockade remaining French forces. Using the part of his fleet that remained in Naples, he supported the Neapolitan army, which, between his efforts and those of the Hamiltons, was now at war with France, to retake Rome from the French, unfortunately Naples, whilst a small and valiant kingdom, was very definitely more heavily emphasised on the small part, and the French regrouped, took back Rome, and then came back to exact their revenge on Neapolitan territory itself. This forced Nelson to evacuate the royal family and anyone of high rank, including the Hamiltons, who needed to get away from the French, Albeit that in the middle of all of this, Nelson was promoted to Rear Admiral of the Red through the general advancement of seniority. He was now faced with having to blockade the same city that he had formerly stayed in, and was also in the process of transferring his flag to Fort Faudrayon, which was finally ready for service. Whilst a combination of blockade and popular uprising managed to unseat the French from Neapolitan territory once more, King Ferdinand was forced to make a number of concessions to France, and thus the overall British position in the Italian peninsula was quite badly weakened by this escapade. One small bright spot, however, was the capture of the Généraux, one of the two French ships of the line that had escaped the Battle of the Nile, and the one that had captured HMS Leander. He also proved perhaps unnecessarily ruthless in dealing with Neapolitan rebels that had sided with the French, breaking treaty conditions that had been agreed between them and the Neapolitans, which meant that quite a few of them were put on trial and executed rather than sent to France, as had been previously agreed. This was capped off by the execution of Admiral Francesco Caracolo, who had been a Neapolitan admiral, briefly changed sides, and although there were many claims for his clemency, or at the very least allowing himself some time to prepare for execution by firing squad, Nelson instead ordered him pretty much summarily hanged. Jervis, or Earl St. Vincent, was replaced by the wonderfully named Lord Keith, and Nelson's penchant for rebelliousness was beginning to show through quite worryingly, now, not only was he now sub-designating orders from the Admiralty, but outright refusing orders and giving excuses as to why he needed to cut missions short that didn't really hold up on close examination. They just all seemed to revolve around him being able to get back to Naples and, more specifically, Emma Hamilton as quickly as possible. The Admiralty wasn't happy with him, and neither, to be honest, was Lord Keith, and it's perfectly understandable why. After using Fondrion as a royal cruise ship and then transferring his flag to HMS Alexander, Nelson was found to be disobeying Keith's orders again, this time refusing to join Keith's main fleet. Keith had pretty much had enough at this point and sailed to demand in person an explanation from Nelson, with the result that Nelson struck his flag and would convey the Hamiltons, who had been recalled, back to the UK on foot. Or, to be perfectly accurate, by carriage. They did this by working their way up Italy through Austria and through what's now Germany, before picking up a ship at Hamburg, arriving back in England, to great applause from the British public but a somewhat colder reception from the Admiralty, who viewed both his social indiscretions and his insubordination 
as conduct that was quite unbecoming of a man of his station. To cap it all off, his marriage broke down as his wife gave him an ultimatum between continuing to live with her or continuing to have dealings with Emma Hamilton, and Nelson tried to forge a middle path by saying that although he still loved his wife, he couldn't go back on treating Lady Hamilton with affection and admiration, at which point Lady Nelson decided that was pretty much that. Whilst the great wheel of seniority continued to turn and Nelson became a Vice Admiral of the Blue at the start of 1801, his social indiscretions were beginning to become quite irritating and quite embarrassing for the Admiralty, who decided that it would perhaps be best to get him somewhere where he wasn't going to be in the company of Emma Hamilton all the time, and also perhaps in a position where he couldn't disregard their wishes quite so easily. So he was instructed to raise his flag aboard HMS San Josef, that would be, yes, the one that he'd captured at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, and put under the command of Earl St. Vincent as part of the Channel Fleet. However, an even better opportunity to get him out of their hair showed up shortly thereafter, and he was reassigned to HMS St. George, and instructed to join Admiral Sir Hyde Parker's fleet, heading for the Baltic. As in this area, there was a new war to be fought. The British had quite understandably been blockading French trade. However, the French did almost as much trade with the Baltic countries, that being Russia, Prussia, Denmark and Sweden, as the British did, and this was hurting their income quite a bit. Uh, they were also somewhat annoyed by the British consistently searching their own ships, looking for contraband that might be being sent to France. And so they'd formed the League of Armed Neutrality in an effort to get Britain to back off. Britain's response was to send in the Royal Navy, that being Sir Admiral Sir Hyde Parker's fleet. Parker had a mind to blockade Denmark, as this would be a fairly low-risk strategy, but a good way of expressing force, since, of course, if you could blockade Denmark's coast, you're also throttling the supply of merchant ships into and out of the Baltic. But in a move that will come as a shock to precisely nobody at this point, Nelson had a somewhat more aggressive strategy in mind. He wanted to take the fleet in and attack the Danish fleet directly in their harbour at the capital of Copenhagen. While Nelson's social strategies may have been somewhat wanting, his tactical strategies remained sound, and he managed to persuade Parker to allow him to sail in with a portion of the fleet, whilst Parker would stay further back and cover against any possible intrusion by other fleets from the League of Armed Neutrality, more particularly the Swedish and Russian fleets, since, with the best will in the world, the Prussian fleet wasn't up to all that much. Whilst the Danish fleet in general was not really that capable of sailing out into battle, more from its material condition and lack of immediate training than from the fact that they their smaller ships would have been heavily outnumbered and outgunned by the British, they did, however, command a fairly strong defensive position. Unlike the French at the Battle of the Nile, there was no way of doubling in behind them, and even if they did, well, the Danish had quite the shore battery waiting for them as well. So this fight would have to be, in some ways, like the Nile, but also a lot worse for Nelson, as he would have to face both concentrated shore battery fire and the Danish fleet, all from a single line. In order to command the action more closely, he transferred to the 74-gun HMS Elephant as his flagship, the second-rate St. HMS St. George of 98 guns was considered a bit too large and carrying a bit too much draft to be able to safely manoeuvre in the shallow waters outside Copenhagen. Faced with this situation, Nelson's plans therefore evolved. Unlike the Nile, the strategy would be somewhat simpler, but also somewhat more complicated, if that makes any sense. The idea was for the British fleet to sail in line formation down at the outside of the Danish fleet, with the lead British ship putting its anchors down as soon as it came opposite one of the Danish vessels. Then the rest of the fleet would sail round it with the next vessel in line coming across the second Danish ship and dropping its own anchors and so on and so forth as they rolled down the line. This was considered a superior option to sailing 
to perfectly match the Danish fleet and then dropping anchor, as it meant that the first British ship would engage a single target and could be supported by the rest of the fleet as it came past, as opposed to having to engage multiple fresh ships as it sailed on down the line. And this, of course, would repeat all the way down the British line if they went with a more conventional tactic. Thus, every vessel as it anchored would be supported by its fellows until the entire line was engaged. The Danes, for their part, had not only reinforced their shore defences and their anchored ships, but had also constructed a number of low-lying floating batteries, which the British had missed in their initial reconnaissance. This battle started relatively badly for Nelson, as the Danish fire was considerably heavier than expected for the reasons mentioned above, and the Danes themselves proved to be quite the tenacious fighters, sticking to their guns, in the words of one officer, long after we should have anticipated a Frenchman to have given up his ship. The fact that HMS Russell, HMS Bologna, and Nelson's old favourite HMS Agamemnon all managed to run aground in the channel, thus removing three ships of the line from Nelson's formation, which was only 12 strong to begin with, also didn't help matters. And so began what can only be described as a naval battle of attrition, with really only the heavier firepower of the individual British ships advantaging them all that much against the Danish vessels, with a number of possible disasters only averted thanks to the superior seamanship and cooperation of the battle-hardened Royal Navy, allowing it to mutually support against Danish positions and ships which were pressing their corresponding numbers particularly hard. Further out into the harbour, Admiral Parker could see three of Nelson's ships flying flags of distress after having gone aground, and could also see that the action hadn't resolved itself particularly in favour of one or side or the other. He also knew that the fleet's standing orders, and indeed the Royal Navy's standing orders, called for any commanding officer to do their utmost against the enemy once action had been joined, and he was worried that perhaps Nelson was fought to a standstill, or perhaps even losing, but didn't feel that he could withdraw without orders from a superior officer. And so he told his flag captain, I will make the signal of recall for Nelson's sake. If he is in condition to continue the action, he will disregard it. If he is not, it will be an excuse for his retreat, and no blame can be imputed to him. Meanwhile, an account from within the Nelson's force goes as follows, and with apologies to any Danish listeners. About 1pm, few, if any, of the enemy's heavy ships and prams had ceased to fire. The Isis had greatly suffered by the superior weight of the Provestein's fire, and if it had not been for the judicious division of it by the Desiree, Captain Inman, who raked her, and for other assistance from the Polyphemus, the Isis would have been destroyed. The monarch was also suffering severely under the united fire of the Holstein and Zealand, and the elephant was warmly engaged by the Danabrog, and by two heavy proms on her bow and quarter. Signals of distress were on board the Bologna and Russell, and of the inability from the Agamemnon. The contest in general, although from the relaxed state of the enemy's fire it might not have given room for much apprehension as to the result, had certainly at 1pm not declared itself in favour to either. About this juncture, and in this posture of affairs, the signal was thrown out aboard the London for the action to cease. Lord Nelson was at this time, as he had been during the whole action, walking the starboard side of the quarter-deck, sometimes much animated, and at others heroically fine in his observations. When the signal was made, the signal lieutenant reported to him. He continued his walk, and did not appear to take notice of it. The lieutenant meeting his lordship at the next turn asked whether he should repeat it. Lord Nelson answered, no, acknowledge it. On the officer returning to the poop, his lordship called after him, is number 16 still hoisted? The lieutenant answering in the affirmative, Lord Nelson said, mind you keep it so. He now walked the deck considerably agitated, which was always known by his moving the stump of his right arm. After a turn or two, he said in a quick manner, do you know what's shown on board the Commander-in-Chief, number 39? On asking what that meant, he answered, why to leave off action? Leave off action, he repeated, then added with a shrug, now damn me if I do. He also observed Captain Foley, you know, Foley, I have only one eye, I have a right to be blind sometimes. And then, with an archness peculiar to his character, 
Putting the glass to his blind eye, he exclaimed, I really do not see the signal. This remarkable signal was therefore only acknowledged on board the elephant and not repeated. The action now continued with unabated vigour. About 2 p.m. the greater part of the Danish line had ceased to fire. The taking possession of such ships as had struck was, however, attended with difficulty, partly by reason of the batteries of Amak Island protecting them, and partly because an irregular fire was made on our boats as they approached from the ships themselves. Lord Nelson naturally lost temper at this and observed that he must either send on shore and stop this irregular proceeding, or send in our fire ships and burn them. He accordingly retired to the stern gallery and wrote with great dispatch that well-known letter ad addressed to the Crown Prince, with the address to the brothers of Englishmen, the brave Danes, and in order to show that no hurry had ensued upon the occasion, he sent for a candle to the cockpit and affixed a larger seal than usual. This letter was conveyed on shore through the contending fleets by Captain Sir Frederick Thesiger, who had acted as his lordship's aide-de-camp, and who found the prince near the sally port. While the boat was absent, the animated fire of the ships ahead of us and the approach of two of the commanders in chief's division, the Ramillies and Defence, caused the remainder of the enemy's line to the eastward of the Trecrona to strike. The firing from the Crown Battery and from our leading ships did not cease until past three o'clock, when the Danish adjutant general Lindholm, returning with a flag of truce, directed the fire of the battery to be suspended. The signal for doing the same on our part was then made from our ship to those engaged, and the action closed after five hours' duration, four of which were warmly contested. The firing by ostensibly surrendered vessels on incoming British boats was probably a result of some poorly trained or excitable crew, but was a fairly flagrant breach of the rules of war, hence Nelson's threat to set fire to everything, crew being on board or not. Eventually, a 24-hour truce was called, which was just as well as three more British ships went aground, but between the heavy casualties inflicted by the Danish batteries on the British ships, as well as the fact that the British were anticipating possibly having to fight either the Swedish or Russian squadrons, or potentially both, they felt they didn't have enough crew left to man the 12 prizes, and so 11 were burned, with only one of them, Holstein, being taken into English service. Three other Danish ships had been destroyed in the battle. An extensive negotiation would follow, but the assassination of the Russian Tsar made it much easier for the Danes to reach an amicable peace agreement, as it was very unlikely the Russians would be able to retaliate to the Danes' breaking of the League of Armed Neutrality by agreeing a separate peace with the British. Admiral Sir Hyde Parker then took the fleet deeper into the Baltic to try and persuade the Swedes and then the Russians to withdraw, but took no particular major offensive action when the Swedish fleet returned to port, and he also refused to sail further east to try and deal directly with the Russians. As a result, he would be recalled, and Nelson now gained his first full fleet command, albeit that when he headed over to try and deal with the Russian squadron, he found that the Russians had fallen back to Kronstadt with the melting of the ice, and that the League of Armed Neutrality was in the beginnings of collapse anyway. Still, this wasn't to be the last time that a British fleet would turn up off of Copenhagen, expecting the Danes to stop being so annoyingly neutral. After a return to London and an elevation to a Viscount tree as a result of his victory at Copenhagen, Nelson was put in charge of the Channel Fleet as Napoleon was making one of his several attempts to think about invading the UK. But nothing much would come of it, and in October 1801, the Peace of Amiens was signed, and the war was officially over, at least for the minute. Nelson would now spend the next two years ashore, as the Royal Navy stood down from its wartime operations, dabbling in politics, mostly staying with the Hamiltons, and touring around the country where he was welcomed as a hero. But by May 1803, war had broken out once again, and Nelson's year and a bit ashore was well and truly over. He would now be granted his first full commander-in-chief position, that of the Mediterranean fleet, and would head south to Portsmouth, where he would board a ship that had been his shadow 
throughout his naval career, from the first days of his lieutenant's training, through battles such as the one at Cape St. Vincent. Yep, it was HMS Victory, the great first-rate ship of the line. His orders were to blockade the French fleet at Toulon, and prevent them from joining up with the Spanish fleet, and thus threatening the English coast with invasion once again. But that is where we will leave Admiral Nelson as he heads out to Toulon aboard the Victory with the rest of his fleet, as this would be the beginning of the campaign that would culminate with the Battle of Trafalgar, which will be part three in this look at Nelson's life. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.